Today you're going to hear a Father's Day message on how important your role as a man is. Let's give Gavin a way world outreach. Hello and welcome. Love you, man. Love you. Hey, everybody. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. So in honor of Father's Day, I'm going to be doing a classic Father's Day message today. I pray it's a message you'll never forget. But before that, I just have a message from someone in my family who wants to say hi to y'all. Go ahead. Can you say hi, everybody? Say hello. I like to have my hands around my face. I like to put into on my thumb and my finger. My chubby cheeks. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Have like <laughs> a little awake time. Have a little awake time. Good job. Good job, everybody. Eat, in awake, sleep. Give her a hand. That's my little girl. Just had a baby girl. And uh, that was her uh, one day after being born in the hospital. And uh, her name is Legacy River Tate. And uh, it comes straight out of the book of Joshua chapter 4. She's going to be a mighty woman of God. And uh, yeah, so anyway, we're having a great time. <laughs> thank you, thank you. If you guys know my son Max, my son Max, of course, is obsessed with her. We knew it was going to happen. He loves being a big brother. So um, happy Father's Day to me. Ha! All right. Praise God. Um, so right before I get into this Father's Day message, I want to do a little bit of an intro. We are in a growth series. So John chapter 15, 1 through 3, it says this. We're going to go to John 15, 1 through 3. I am the true vine. My father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. So right before I give this message to fathers, I just want to say this. What is coming to you is a word today. This word is going to cut you. It's very, very important that you understand the way that God grows you is he has to cut you. Do you know that the word covenant means to cut? It has two meanings. It means two people with one agreement, and it means to come in between and cut. You see, God is fulfilling his role in your life today by cutting you. He's keeping his promise to you by cutting you. Why? Because God rewards the areas of your life that are growing by cutting you again. God rewards growth by cutting you again. Why? Because he wants more fruit. Whoever has told you that God does not like growth, they've never read the Bible. Whoever's told you that God is into you being poor or, have, you know, a poverty mindset, not having peace, that you're not supposed to have a lot of success, that's not just prosperity preaching. You, you could put it in that label if you want to. But God is obsessed with growth. God is obsessed with growth. Look at what it says here in John 15, uh, verse 5. I'm the vine, you're the branches. If you remain in me, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Now look, how do you bear much fruit? Remaining in Jesus. This is powerful. Every person who's watching today, fruit does not have to work to grow. It just has to stay connected. Fruit does not have to work to grow. This is not on you to be the best father or the best mother or these things. God, Philippians 2.13, is working with you. He's working in you, giving you the power and the desire to do what pleases him. Can somebody say hallelujah? John 15.8, look at this. This is to my father's glory. What? That you don't have anything, that you're not successful, that you stay exactly where you're at. No, it's to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit. And look at this, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Look at what the Amplified says. When you bear much fruit, you prove yourself to be my true disciple. So in other words, disciples are always growing. Today, you're going to get an opportunity to grow. Now, there are two ways that Jesus cuts us. They're in the Bible. The second one I can't talk about today. I'll be talking about it at Arrowhead next week. But it is God using ugly and difficult people in your life to help you grow. Not people that you like. Not people that you get along with. But one of the greatest tools God uses ugly people that annoy you in order to promote you. That's what God does. I'm not going to talk about that today. It's a whole other sermon. But here, God gives the number one way he does it. 
through a spoken word. And right now, as we go into this word, God is sending out his shears. He's sending out his cutters so that you can be the greatest father you've ever wanted to be. You know how God's going to make you the greatest father? Not by you standing there going, I just got to be better. I got to do more. No, you got to allow yourself to get cut. Are you going to let that happen today? This is a message for the fathers, but it's a message for the family. Let's get into it today. Psalm 68, verse 5 through 6, if you can put it up, and I'll take it from there. A father to the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy dwelling. God sets the lonely in families. He leads out the prisoners with singing, but the rebellious live in a sun-scorched land. God relates to himself as a father to the fatherless. He said, this is God. Matter of fact, fatherhood is themed more than 1,100 times in the Bible as the central focus of God's attention. Now listen, there is no other attribute in the Bible that God compares himself to more. Is he a creator? Of course. Is he a king of kings? Absolutely. Is he ruler of all? Absolutely. But God relates to himself more than any other attribute as a father. Think about Jesus. Jesus came to reveal the Father. John 14, 6 through 7 says this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. No one's going to come to see the Father who I'm going to want to show you except if you come to me. He says in John 5, 19, so Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. Whatever the Father does, that's what I do. You see, Jesus was very careful that he made sure that every action he did, it was what his Father did. He made sure that everything he said, he wanted you to get the Father. He was saying it through his mouth because when he said it, it was because the Father said it. He was doing it with his hands because when he did it, it's because the Father first did it. He was trying to show you the Father. Look at this, John 5, 19. This is so powerful. Jesus, our Hebrews 1, 3, the Son is the radiance and only expression of the glory of God. He's the reflection, the exact representation, the perfect imprint, look at this, of his Father's essence. Jesus came on earth. Did he die for your sins? Yes. Did he come in order to destroy the works of the enemy? The Bible says that. But he came as well to show you the Father. You see, fatherhood is so important to God. The first thing the Holy Ghost does when he comes inside of your life, if you have said you pray, if you said, I'm saved, would you raise your hand? If you're confident, I know I'm going to heaven. Look at all these people. Don't be ashamed of that. That's a powerful thing. We should be excited about that. If you know you're going to heaven, guess what happened the moment you got saved? The Holy Spirit came inside of you. Now, when the Holy Ghost comes inside of you, he has a lot of jobs to do. How many of y'all know you still got a lot of work to be done on that brain of yours? Your thoughts need a lot of help. He's going to work on that. How many of y'all know some of your bodies are really sick? He's going to work on that if you obey his leading. How you do your diet, what you do with your life. He'll literally walk you through healing. That's what the Holy Ghost does. How many of y'all know you got to get better and you're really selfish? How many of y'all are like, I'm just a selfish person. I got to get over myself. Come on, be honest now. Okay, how many of y'all got a little bit of problem with your tongue? Like if God could just come in and like maybe cut your tongue in half, then you'd be okay. But some of y'all got tongues that are all the way to the back of this building. You swoop down buildings because you just talk so much. My God. So some of y'all need just one personality because some of y'all got like 70 personality. So God needs to come. You see what I'm saying? So the Holy Ghost has got a lot to work on. But the first thing that he does, look at this in Galatians 4, 6 through 7, the first job the Holy Ghost does, because we are God's children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts prompting us to call out, Abba, Father. Now you are no longer slaves, but God's child. And since you're his child, he made you his heir. Do you know the first thing the Holy Ghost gets you to do is to say, I have a father. His name is God. My God is my father. Why? Because you belong to the devil before you belong to God. Because you belong to the world before you belong to God. And God does not leave orphans unattended. He puts the lonely in families. Where were you at before the Father found you? 
Some of y'all didn't even have physical fathers that were there. But God came and he said, I won't let them go orphan. I will not let them have a life of uh, loneliness and despair. I come and I say I'm your father. And the Holy Ghost literally inside of you gets you to say it. Why is it so important that you say it? Because you know what? It's there for you. But if you don't believe it and if you don't say it yourself, you won't act like it's yours. You have a father. I don't care who tried to leave you out. I don't care who's made you feel despair. I don't know how your father treated you, but I want you to know something. He's not just a father. He's a good father. He's a good father. And he's there for you today. You see, he does his duties well. See, first thing he did was he chose you. And your purpose before you were even born. Psalm 139 says this. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of my days. They were formed for me. Yet there was no days yet. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I could count them, they'd be more than the sand. I awake and you're with me. You see, if you would take one small, one small cubic foot of sand, there are over 2.1 billion grains one small cubic foot of sand over 2.1 billion grains and God says I think about you more than all the sands on all the seashores of all the earth you don't know what obsession is because God is so obsessed with you God is obsessed with you he loves you do you know that the moment a sperm touches an egg there is a light they literally have caught it under telescope, microscope. They literally see in the microscope that the moment that conception is made, a burst of light happens. Why? Because even God is in the process the moment you were chosen. Do you know there could have been millions of other possibilities, but he chose you. He chose you before anybody else knew you. He chose you before you were a bleep on a screen, before your mama could name you, before anybody could say, you're pregnant, baby, before anybody could do that, God had already known, and he called you something, and he purposed you, and he said, I approve of you, I say you're amazing, I don't care what they say about you. Now listen, this is before you ever prayed a prayer. This is before you ever led anybody to Jesus. This is before you ever served on the altar team. God already said, I want you to know before anybody else condemns you, I approve you. Before anybody else gossips about you, I love you. What a God. See, he takes you and he sees you. And then what does he do? He adopts you and loves you. It said in Ephesians 1.5, God decided in advance to adopt us into his family. Bringing us to himself through Jesus. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. He loves you. 1 John 3, 1. See how our very father, how much he loves us. We are his children, and that is what we are. But the people who belong to this world don't recognize him because they don't know him. You see, God loves you. He calls you his own. Then you know what he does? Because a good father does this. He provides for you. Matthew 7, 11, look at this. If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give gifts? Come on, to those who ask him. God's not going to give you something bad. He said, if you ask me for this, I'm not going to give you a snake. If you ask me for a snake, I'm not going to. He said, I'm not going to give you bad gifts. The Bible says in James 1, 17, my life verse, every good and perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of lights, whom there's no shadow of turning. God doesn't have to think about it. God doesn't have to remind himself to love you and to bless you. He is love for you. He is blessing for you. The Father loves you. Somebody in here, whether you're in the back or in the front, you got to hear it. Before anybody else rejected you, God is still here to love you. And you know what he does? He stays faithful to you. 1 Corinthians 1, 9, God is faithful by whom you were called into fellowship with the Son. You see, you might have had friends. You thought they were going to be with you forever, but they didn't end up being that. You might have had husbands or wives. You thought they were going to be faithful, and maybe your heart was broken. I don't know the situation maybe you've had, but I know this. God is faithful. He won't leave you. He won't forsake you. You can always run to him. This is a place you can come. It is called God's house because the Father is in it. You see, but fatherhood is under attack. Fatherhood has been an attack since the beginning. There's an epidemic, listen, of fatherlessness. It's not an epidemic of cancer. 
It's not an epidemic. It's a worse disease. It's called fatherlessness. What do you mean? Well, how does it affect? Well, let's just look at a couple of facts. How about poverty? Fatherlessness, children in a father absent home are almost four times more likely to be poor. Children living in female-headed households with no spouse present have a poverty rate of 46.6% and four times the married couple. How about two? How about drug and alcohol abuse? The U.S. Health Department of Human Services states that fatherless children are at a more dramatical risk of drug and alcohol abuse. How about physical and emotional health? Children of a single parent home are more than twice as likely to commit suicide. How about educational? 71% of high school dropouts are fatherless. How about crime? Children who come into a house with violence are more likely to be victimized, put in a witness or witness a violent crime. How about this? A study of 109 juvenile offenders indicated the family structure significantly predicts delinquency. In other words, they could look at kids and see if they have a father in the home and literally depict with pretty good accuracy whether they were going to be in the juvenile system or not. Because a father outside of the home equals a vulnerable home. However, look at this. Do you know that the enemy tried to get Jesus to be without a father? Do you know that this was tried by Jesus? What are you talking? Well, this is Matthew 1. Read the Bible. Joseph, to whom Mary was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace Mary publicly. So he decided to break the engagement quietly. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, Don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Ghost. And she will have a son. You're going to name him Jesus, and he's going to save the people from their sins. What's going on? You see, the enemy was trying to, in a subtle way, take Joseph out of the home. But God the Father would not allow his son to be raised in a home without two parents. You see, you got to understand something. This is powerful. God sent Jesus as the greatest gift to us. But God's gift to his own son was that he put him in a family with two parents. Jesus is God's greatest gift to you. But God gave his son a gift while he was on earth. He made sure he grew up with two parents parents. You see, fatherlessness has been an epidemic for a long time. You see, it's true that with the father, children are 50% less likely to suffer abuse and neglect. They're 75% less likely to have a teen birth. They're 50% less likely to suffer obesity. They're 50% less likely to drop out of high school. And they're 80% less likely to spend time in jail, all from just having a father present. How does it impact serving God? What is the likelihood of if your father serves God, the whole family will? Well, let's look at this. If a child gets saved first in the family, there's a very small proven likelihood that the rest of the family will get saved. There is a small percentage, but they really can't even count it. But if the mother gets saved, look at this, there is a 27% chance. But if the father gets saved, there's a 93% chance the rest of the family will serve God. Now, I want to say something real quick to single moms, because you're special to the Lord. I want to say this. This is not just me encouraging you. This is proven that the likelihood of your children serving God is like 90% more likely they will if you have a weekly, life-giving, faith-based community of people that love you and can help your children. Why? Because this is what God does. This is so powerful. God puts the lonely in families, but sometimes those families might not have been their natural ones. But God has fathers, God fathers throughout this body, men who are willing to help you with your children and influence your kids. God has God fathers. I, uh, I, um, we all know about Larry, just went to heaven. Very precious friend of mine, but he was Max's godfather. And every time he saw my son, he would give him five dollars. 
Literally, I'm talking since the moment we got here to this church. This has been over a year and a half. My family has been here. Every time Larry saw Max, he would give him money because he said, that boy's got favor on his life. And he says, I got to be a part of that favor. Every shoe, basically, that I've ever worn has come from Larry on this stage. There's so many stories and things I could say about him. But Godfathers are important. They're special. They're people that God has for you. Do not, don't fall into despair if you're a single mom. God has men that he's already appointed to help. I'm just going to give you one quick example. Hagar and Ishmael are in the Bible. I'm not going to read the entire story, but it's in Genesis 21. It says that Abraham had taken Hagar and Ishmael and told them they have to leave because Sarah was having some issues and didn't want them there. And it said they're about to die. They're thirsty. They're hungry. And it said God comes and he said these beautiful words. Why are you crying, Hagar? I see your son. I know you might think you're all alone out here. I know you might think that nobody sees you or anybody cares. I see your son. I'm going to make him a great nation. You see, God, when you have decided, single mom, single father, this is really important. When you have decided to let your life be a service offering to God, when you have dedicated to his house, when you say, I'm not going to let anything stop. I've had mistakes. But when you did not let your shame and your guilt keep you from the arms of God, he is going to take responsibility for your children. He's going to make them great. But there is such a thing as an orphan spirit. These are kids that have two parents, but still feel invisible and never seen. They were raised with parents, but felt unparented. They exist all around us. But God has shown us what a good father is. We know it's just not because you share the DNA of a child. That doesn't make you a good father. Just because they have your DNA does not make you a good father. God has shown us what a good father is. But look at this. Here's the question today. Are we prioritizing? Are we prioritizing our role as a good father as much as God does? Or are we prioritizing everything and everyone else above that role? So let's get into the word real quick. I only have a few minutes left, but let your heart be touched right now. Exodus chapter 4, 24 through 26. Once again, I'm not going to take the time to read it because I have a shortness of time. Moses is on his way to a place after delivering the Israelites. And the Bible says that the Lord confronted Moses and was about to kill him. Many of y'all might not know this story. I promise it's right here in the Bible. God is about to kill Moses. You mean Moses who parted the Red Sea? Yeah, that Moses. Moses who led him out of the wilderness for 40 years? Yeah, Moses who got the water out of the rock? That Moses, God was going to kill him. Why? It says the poor his wife takes a stone and circumcises their son, and all of a sudden God's not mad anymore. Like, what is going on? Well, in the book of Genesis, you got to read about Abraham, the book of Genesis 17. It says that Abraham was told by God that this is need to be a responsibility. you got to circumcise every boy from generation to generation. This will be a lasting thing that you have to do. So Moses knows about this. Now, please hear me. Moses knows that the Hebrews have to be circumcised. Remember, this is Old Testament. God takes this very, very seriously. But Moses was busy ministering to other people. Please hear me. God had told him to go to the Israelite. He's trying to do his best. But in the process, he doesn't minister to his own house. He's busy ministering to everyone else. But he doesn't minister to his own son. You see, is it possible that our jobs, our works, we're so busy we give our best to everyone else, we come back to the house and we can't even talk to our wives? You're out there at work giving the best for the job because you think provision is what matters the most. But let me just correct you. Your presence is what matters the most. And if you are giving the best to everyone else, remember, God wants you to know the scraps were not left for your kids. The scraps are not left for your wife. But Moses was caught up. There's ministry going on. People are getting saved. Everything's happening. It's awesome. But please understand, do you think that's because of you? 
Do you know that people would be getting saved even if you weren't involved? Think about that. Do you know that people would be getting healed even if you weren't involved? God would just find somebody who submits to him. God, listen, you got to understand that your part, God wants you to be a part of it. God wants to co-work with you. God wants you to do it. But at the same time, it's not at the expense. If your own house, listen, if Moses would have died, if his wife hadn't have saved his behind. I mean, y'all wives are like, I've done that a few times for my husband, saved his behind. Okay. <laughs> if his wife, then Moses is dead, y'all. You're not reading about all of these things. We wouldn't read about Moses doing all these things because he forgot his own house. Do you know that the Bible is full of a bunch of men who are anointed and terrible fathers? Let me just read another one. You ready? How about Aaron? Aaron, Leviticus chapter 2, 10, 1 through 2. Let's see what happens to his kids. Aaron's son Nadab and Abihu put the coals of the fire on the incense burn and sprinkled them over them. In this way, they disobeyed the Lord by burning before him, listen, the wrong kind of fire. The original King James says a strange fire. The word strange means common. They took God's presence as common. They treated God as common. They treated what is sacred as common. Why? Because Aaron, even though he's out there with Moses, he's being Moses' mouthpiece, he's making speeches, y'all. Listen, he's making speeches to between two to three million people daily. You got There's no sound systems back then, guys. He's getting up there without a speaker, and God is anointing his voice so much that he projects where two million people back are hearing his words. That's power. But at the same time, his own sons who are supposed to be trained in the priesthood, he neglects to the point where they are burned alive dead. Anointed man didn't teach his own kids how to have his same heart. How about Samuel? You see, because maybe what they need is not all of that all the time. Maybe they just need you to sit down and pray with them. Maybe your kids just need you to get the Bible out and just say, let's talk a little bit about Jesus. Maybe they need you to get the growth book and just sit down and say, we're going to go through the growth book every morning, y'all. We're going to have some toast. Remember how, how, how incredible Samuel was. It's fine if you get me another mic. I don't care. Remember how incredible Samuel was. Samuel was so anointed that every word he said did not fall to the ground. God backed up everything he said. Yet when you read about his sons, look at what it says. Their sons were not like their father, for they were greedy for money. They accepted bribes, perverted justice. Finally, they said, listen, you're about to die. You're getting old. And your sons are not like you. So give us a king and a judge to rule over us. That's Saul. You see, Samuel had intended that his sons would take over for him. But because he did not show them his heart, they became evil. Is it possible that we are doing all the ministry? That we're giving ourselves to everything of our jobs, our lives? But we can't sit down and sit with our son and just read some scripture? Is it possible that we're doing all of these things, but we're leading groups, we're leading, you know, our DGs, we're going leading and all, but have you sat down with your own wife and your own kids and led a DG? You see, God says that fatherhood is important. You see the response of what happens when a father's not in the home. But do you know it's possible that you could be physically in the home, but not there in your mind? You could be so caught up with work and everything that you're doing that you're sitting in the house, but you're on your phone and things are still happening and all the calls are going on and you're so stressed, you're not even present even though your body is there. How about David? David, the Bible says, had three sons. 
One of them dies because of his adultery, literally dies before it's even born. The second one, uh, the Bible is Absalom. And listen to what it says, he never corrected his son Absalom. David never ever even challenged one thing his son did. He never went up to him and asked like, why do you do that? Do you know that's not what God wants us to do? No, 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 no. He assumed, he, see, see, he assumed, well, I got him a palace. I've given him all the food he could want. I've given him all the things he could want, but he never sat down. This is the king. This is one of the most famous people in the Bible, slaying giants. But his son, his own son. How about Absalom? Absalom is one of the most saddest stories in the Bible because Absalom is his other son. And once again, he didn't correct him. And the Bible says that Absalom ended up, listen, he ended up hanging from a tree by his hair with arrows going through his chest. The precious son of David. It said David wept and mourned and cried. Because it is possible, listen, it is possible to sacrifice your family on the altar of what you call ministry. I told you this word might cut you a little bit today, but please understand, God's just trying to work on your heart to be a father. God wants you to realize how important a father is. God wants you to know that there is a ministry right here. It's sitting next to you in your wife. There's a ministry right here. It's right there with your children. Do I think you're going to stop serving? No, but you're not going to stop serving. You're not going to, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is you better have your first priority straight. You see, your greatest present to your family, maybe you just need to have a conversation with your son. Maybe you just need to correct him. Say, hey, what's going on in your heart? Don't just correct him and say, stop that. Have you even found out why they do it? Have you found out what's going on in their heart or their mind? Have you, have you tried to understand? You know, it's tough being a teenager these days. Did you know that? Did you know how much the devil is after your teens? Do you know all the confusion they're constantly seeing online? How about your children? My gosh, in the second grade in school, they're trying to tell your children, asking them questions. What do you think about two men when they kiss? What do you think about sexual? They're trying to doubt everything about themselves. The enemy is after your children. But you know what you can do? My father taught me, this is a whole nother message maybe sometime. It's called turning the soil. Ever since I was a young boy, my dad would sit down when I met a new friend. And he'd sit down and he'd just ask me, he said, so, so, so what was he like? And what did you guys do? And simple questions. And then he said, did he say anything to you about what you guys talk about? And then I would start saying the conversations and my dad would see, he would call them weeds. He said, I could see weeds that were trying to plant in your heart and I had to excavate them as soon as possible. So through a conversation, he said, I would turn the soil. He did this with my sisters. He did this with me. He said, and I didn't even know it was happening. I was a kid. He would turn the soil where he would ask the conversations we've been having and the things we've been seeing on TV and the way we've been believing. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't come down on us. He just had conversations. And within the conversation, he'd be like, well, son, this is what God actually says about this. Well, son, and what did he do? He was taking out a weed that could have formed in my heart. He was turning the soil to make sure there were no weeds. There, there was something. You see, you got to take time. Parenting is work. Lazy parents will not have powerful kids. Lazy parents will not have powerful kids. But God has called you. You know the reason you have those kids? Because God thinks you can do it. Listen to what I just said. The only reason you have those kids is because God believes in you. He believes you're ready. He believes you can do it. Money is not first. Look at what the Bible says, Proverbs 15, 27. The one who puts earning money above his family will have trouble at home. You see, I understand provision, it's important. But the greatest present that you can give your family is your presence. The greatest present you can give your family. Here's the deal. I want to encourage every man in here. If you put God's priorities first, if your priorities are the same as God's, Matthew 6, is very, very clear. He'll add all of these things, the clothes you need to wear, the food you need to eat. It all is attracted to you. You see, because God blesses people 
who have the same priorities he does. If your priorities are in the right place, I promise, your, your family's not going to go hungry. I promise. You're going to keep working hard. Everybody's, I, I, it's never going to change. You know what's going to happen though? The burden's going to be lifted from you, dad. You're going to feel like God is working with you now to make you a better husband. You're going to feel his help constantly to make you a better father. He's going to give you a heart to understand your teenager. He's going to give you a heart to understand your 35, 40-year-old son and daughter. We got to get the father's heart. There are so many examples of how God says we have to put the family before other people. Look, look at this, 1 Timothy 5.8. Look at this beautiful, just be in there. First Timothy 5, 8 says this, if anyone fails to provide for his own relatives and especially for those of his own family, he has disowned the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Wow. How about your wife? First Peter 3, 7, in the same way. Come on, put that up there. In the same way, there it is. You husbands live with your wives in an understanding way with great gentleness and tact, and with an intelligent regard for the marriage relationship, as with somebody physically weaker, because since she's a woman, show her honor and respect as a fellow heir of grace, so that your prayers will not be hindered or ineffective. You're out there ministering to everybody, you're helping them, but how are you treating your wife? Because God is looking at what's going on in your house. He's looking at what's going on in your house, and you could be getting resisted. You know the devil's number one target? It's your marriage. Just so you know, the devil doesn't attack you from without. He comes from within. He tries to sow discord between you and your wife, and he tried just small misunderstandings, and here's what happens. People allow, they know that there's a rift that's coming in between them. They can feel it, the husband and the wife. You can feel there's gaps that are coming, but nobody says something. Because you'll go to bed just hoping maybe we'll be better tomorrow. But if you do that enough times, the gap will form Well, you will be in the same house but feel like strangers. That is not God's best for you. That is not what God wants for you. See, I grew up on the road. I grew up in ministry. Since I was a baby, I napped inside of pastor's offices. I woke up with my dad counseling pastors. I went to sleep with my dad counseling pastors. That, my life was that. We lived in a fifth wheel trailer and we traveled all the way around the states on the road. I was homeschooled for most of my life because we had to travel. And not only did I get incredible exposure to the power of God and prophecy and miracles who made me who I am, but I also got exposure to the pain. I can't tell you how many times I sat inside of offices with pastors and their wives. And the wife says, I don't know him. He's a pastor to everybody else, but we don't have a relationship. I can't tell you how many times I sat there and kids, their own children, he's the pastor and their own children won't come to church because the church took my dad from me. Listen, here's the secret. I want to encourage you, because if you have a business, you need to know this. If you have a ministry, you need to know this. Fathers, this is how you do it. This is the secret my dad taught me. My dad was gone every single week of my life as I was raised. Every single week he was preaching. Still to this day, my dad just turned 70 years old, and he has been preaching every weekend of my life. <laughs> he took, for the first time, his 70th year anniversary, he took a trip to Europe, and he, that was like three weeks. So he had like a great celebration. Everybody was there to celebrate him. We we're really happy for him. But dad has always gone and preached. He'll never stop. He'll never slow down. My dad says he's going to preach healthy till he's 94 years old. I believe it in Jesus' name. If he'll just stop eating the apple pie, my God. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> but my dad, you know what happened? I never felt like my dad wasn't there. Because he'd be home for a couple days every week. I'd be with my mom and my four sisters. But he'd be home with a couple days. And when he was home, he was there. I learned all my sports from my dad. I, I have all my memories from my dad. And guess what? When he wasn't there, he would take me with him. So, you know, here's the secret. It wasn't my dad's ministry, and then we were at home. It was our ministry. It was our ministry. This is the key. How can you get your wife involved in your business? 
How can you get your kids involved in your ministry? How can you get their hands laying hands on the sick? How can you get their mouth engaging? You see, since I was five years old, all I remember is laying hands on sick people. My dad would just, he'd be there, he'd be laying hands, and I'd walk down the line with them, and I'd hit people in the stomach. Poof, you know, four years old, boom! You know, I'd, I'd hit him as hard as I could. My dad was like, stop it, stop it, you know, trying to lay hands, and I'd be like kicking him in the shin. And... <laughs> but... I saw the mirror because it was our ministry. My question is, are you involving your family? Because if you don't, it's going to be a wedge where God's blessing and his anointing on your life, what he's called you to do in business, is going to be a curse to them. You have to involve them. Do it together. Be together. There's a heart of a father that's inside of every one of us. And Here's the deal, there's so many more things I could say, but I wanna close now by doing a special prayer. Every father, would you stand up in the building if you're a father? Give him a hand, come on, give him a hand. Remember, God keeps his covenant with you and he loves you because he wants you to be better than you've ever been. He wants you to bear more fruit. So this word has gone out today. My question is, are you gonna allow it to cut off from you the things that need to be cut off today? Today on Father's Day could be the end of some of the things you do not like about yourself if you'll allow God to take them. Lift your hands up in the sky, lift your hands up. See, I don't know, there might be single fathers here today. Maybe, maybe you're a father and he was in the wrong situation. You weren't married, he was born out of sin. Listen, you have these children. No child is a mistake. No child is a problem. It doesn't matter what you did to bring them in. Listen, God sees them and he cares about them. He needs you there. He wants to make you a father for this child. He wants you to have the heart that he has for them. He wants you to be able to speak like he can speak, but you need God's help. You see, fathers, we try to carry the weight of the world on our shoulders. We got to provide. We can't be vulnerable. We can't be stressed. We can't ask for help. Those are lies from the devil. He's going to help you provide. He's going to come alongside you. He's going to help you understand. Now, if you have your hands lifted, I want to ask you a question. Do you want to be a father like the father? It's going to take a daily, what we're doing right now, you're going to have to get by yourself, take a walk, go in the car, lift up your hand, and it's a simple prayer. I'm praying it all the time, especially with the second baby. God, I want your heart for my child. I want your heart for legacy. I want your heart for Max. God, I want to be understanding. God, I've been so impatient. God, I'm sorry I lost my temper the other day. This is what's going to happen. You're going to have to get vulnerable with God and ask him for help. Philippians 2.13, God is working in you, giving you the power and the desire to do what pleases him. You're not by yourself. You don't have to carry this by yourself, but your family needs your presence. Close your eyes. Look up to heaven. I'm going to pray for you right now. In this moment, I'm going to ask. If you say, I want God to radically touch me right now, I need a touch from God, I, I want God to cut off from me the things that I have been leaving. I, I'm, I'm, I'm submitting to the conviction. I'm submitting to the cut. I want you to come up to the front right now. Come up quick, right now. Come up quick, right now. Fathers, come up. Come on, come on, come on. Hands up, hands up. Don't wait for anybody. Hands up right now. Men, come up here. Come on, men. Come on, men. Come on. Come up boldly. Come up strong. Father's in the house. Father's in the house. Hands lifted up. The anointing is strong right here. Put your hands up. Don't wait. Jesus is already wanting to help you. This is a submission prayer. This is a repentance prayer. God loves you. He's wanting to give you the heart of the Father. Come on, let them up as they keep coming closer. Pack in, pack in. Come up closer, guys. Come up closer. You got people behind you. Come up closer right now. Come up closer. Every person, come up. There you go. Push up to the stage. That's fine. Now, this is what I want to happen. Pastor Marco's already on the stage. 
I'm going to ask Pastor Christian to come up on the stage. I'm asking Resty to come up on the stage. I'm asking Mike to come up on the stage. I'm asking Gary if you're still here. I'm asking, listen, I want some of these, main, these strong men to come up on the stage with me as we pray for you. Every person, hands up, close your eyes. Don't focus on anybody but Jesus. Turn that music up just real quick. Just rest in the moment that Jesus is here. I want you to begin asking God for help. You're going to have to humble yourself as a man right now. You're not going to have to worry about whoever's around you. And this is a moment for you to allow God, your Father, to help you. You cannot do this on your own. Come on. Come on. Begin to pray right now on your own. Begin to ask Him to help you. Begin to ask Him to empower you. Begin to ask Him to strengthen you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I see freedom beginning to come to some of you men right now. You've been battling something, trying to hold you back. You're under shame and guilt. Be freed in the name of Jesus. Cast off every weight, the sin so that easily entangles, and run with perseverance. I see a refreshing coming to you men right now. Some of you are tired. Some of you are exhausted. Thank you, God. Just let them know you're there right now in Jesus' name. Come on, mama out there. Stretch your hand out to your husband right here. Come on, daughters. Come on, children. If your father's up here, you should be praying for them right now. That's the power of God, brother. That's the power of God. Let him touch you. He's a loving father. He's a good father. He's a good father. He's a good father. He's a good father. father. This is your father's day. The Father is going to give you a heart like His today. The Father's going to humble you today. The Father's touching you today with His love. The Father's helping you today. Come on, just let it go. You ain't got to worry about what's going on. Be vulnerable before Jesus. He loves you. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Touch Him, God. Touch Him, God. Authority, strength, power. Get me a handheld microphone, please. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to pray a prayer real quick. And I want you to stay in this spirit right now. Spirit of power. Holy Spirit of God. You touch these leaders, these men, these fathers. Give them your heart, Jesus. I thank you, God, that they have admitted they need help. And God, work with them now, Lord. Work with them now, Jesus, we pray. God is working with you. Philippians 2, 13, giving you the power. He's giving you the desire. Some of y'all have the desire, but you can't follow through. God's helping you get the follow through. I know you've tried and you can't follow through. God's helping you get the follow through. Jesus, we love you, Lord, right now. Every person, thank you, God, as we're coming, as we're touching you, as we're reaching our hands out to you. Everybody's in agreement right now. Thank you, God. I'm going to start going through the crowd, laying hands. Pastor Marco is going to say a prayer over you. As he's praying, I'm going to be touching you. Resty, if we could get out there, just touch every man, just quickly, just on their hands. Christian, if we could touch the men out there. Mike, if we get out there and touch, Pastor Marco is going to be praying for you here. God bless you all today. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Lord, we just thank you. Jesus' name. The Father, there's a revival Jesus. beginning in our city and in Jesus. our church. Fathers, your men, Father, are giving their whole Jesus hearts name. to yes, you, God. Lord. Yes, God. Father, when we give our whole Jesus. hearts to you, Father, Jesus. there's no limit Jesus. of what we can do. Jesus. You said in your word, you're not looking at the outward appearance, Holy our Jesus. talents, our Holy abilities, Jesus. our records, yes, Father, God but you're looking Jesus. at our hearts, Lord. Holy so God. I just thank you, Lord, that, Father, Jesus. you are restoring Touch the Lord. hearts Touch of the Lord. Father to the children and the hearts of the children Jesus to their name. fathers. Jesus and I just thank you, Lord, Lord there's a revival, Jesus. Father, happening in our nation, and it's starting right here, Father, in this place right now, as, Father, hundreds of men have made a decision. I want you. 
I want to live for you. I accept my role as a father. And we come against every spirit that's tried to take the fathers out of position. I thank you, Lord. You're a God that restores. You're going to put them right back in their position. And you're going to restore everything that's been lost. Because you're a God that's able to restore. You're a God that's able to raise the dead. It's through your spirit. Baptize them with your fire. Baptize them with your spirit, Father. So when they leave this place, they don't leave with their power, but they leave with your power. They leave out with a heart full of love, a heart that's free, a heart, Father God, that represents you. That, Father, when people talk to them, when their children talk to them, when their wives talk to them, they will see the love of the Father in them, Father. There's a miracle happening here. There's a brand new beginning in the name of Jesus, and we bind every spirit of the enemy, and we say this, your assignment is canceled by the blood of Jesus. These men are free to live for God, to be warriors, to stand up, Father, for what righteousness and justice for their families, their marriages. In the name of Jesus, we declare victory in Jesus' name. Come on, man. Let's give a roar and a praise to God. Come on, let's give a roar and a praise to God. Come on, let's go to the next leg. Come on, everybody stand up. Come on, let's give a thanks to God for what he's done this Father's Day. Let's give one more praise. Come on, man. Come on, act like you got your victory. This truly can be the best Father's Day of your life. Will you accept a brand new start? This is your brand new start. And whatever's not fixed, we serve a God that can fix it, put it back together. He's just saying, just follow me. And if you follow me and you put me first, I'll add everything, I'll add everything back to you. That means there's desires you have in your heart. And those desires aren't dead. It's not too late. God says, I'm a God that restores. And though, just because you have a desire in your heart that has not been fulfilled, it's proof that God's not done with you. Don't you give in to the enemy that tells you your family's better off without you. All these lies of the devil, we don't accept them in Jesus' name. We need you in position. We need you in this church. We love you, man. Come on. This is a miracle already. How many believe this is a miracle already? Having this many men say, God, change my heart. Come on. Women families, you're seeing a miracle here because the revival begins when men take their position. It's time for us to go to war in Jesus' name. Isn't there a cause? Of course there is. Let's give God one more praise. Thank you guys so much.